Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Cloud cost reporting is so critical in our day-to-day -day cloud operations. This is because you cannot improve what you cannot measure, right? Your stakeholders expect insights from your cost reporting so they can make better decisions, such as setting up the better cost governance policies or discover cost optimization opportunities. But there are so many cost reporting solutions out there. It can be a bit overwhelming to understand what service you should use for what purposes. So we're here to help. In this session, we're gonna talk about best practices and strategies for reporting on your cost and usage data. And since we're at reInvent, we're gonna be covering most of the new launches from this week and last week, as well as catching you up to date for some of the launches that happened for our billion cost management services throughout the year. Now, while this session is primarily geared towards the FinOps professionals here and those of you that are managing organizational cloud spend, all the builders here are gonna benefit for being able to know how to improve their cost reporting for their individual applications and their workloads. So before we get started, let's introduce ourselves. My name is Bowen Wong. I'm part of AWS Billing and Cost Management product team as the principal product marketing manager. In my daily role, I got to talk to many customers just like you, and thank you for sharing your feedback. I share those feedback with our engineering and product teams, so we work together to improve our solutions to better serve your needs. And I'm Matt Burke. I'm a principal technical account manager who helps support some of our largest strategic AWS customers improve their operations on AWS. I also serve as one of the leaders for our technical field community on cloud financial management. So if you've asked your account team for a CFM SME or specialist, they most likely come from our community to help you out in your meetings. So let's take a look at what we'll cover today. First, we'll introduce the new AWS Billing and Cost Management Console Home. Yes, it's new and will be a game changer. We're going to talk more about what you can achieve for everything under cloud financial management with this new unified console. <laughs> We will then talk about how we can improve a cost visibility with several features that were just launched this week. We will transition to talk about how you can improve cloud cost accountability with several cost allocation features. We will wrap up with KPIs and our recommendations for next steps. Now, before we dive into these new launches, we just want to level set quickly on cloud financial management in general. What does this practice look like and how does it relate to cost reporting? Where do you even start, right? Well, for most of you, it's gonna start your cloud financial management journey somewhere within these word clouds, right? Because you've had to transition from your physical fixed costs in your data center, like servers, network switches, and storage, to the variable costs that are found on your AWS bill. And reporting on these variable costs, well, they may vary in your organization depending on your focus or your cloud financial management maturity. If you're just getting started or in the process of evaluating your cloud investment, you want to understand the value of the cloud in order to further justify investment. Further along, you may want to understand how to evaluate efficiency of how you're utilizing AWS resources, right? Your audience also plays a big part in how you report to AWS costs and usage data. For executives, maybe let's start with the total invoice spent for the past few months so they can get a trend. But for your IT managers, they may want to ask you what's the individual resource spend level. They want that granularity. And as you've built those reports for your executive and individual stakeholders, you might have begun building a cloud financial management or FinOps practice without realizing it, right? You started to allocate that spend to the business units, application owners that were responsible for it. And you broke that down into projects or applications or individual entities. You decided on policies that placed guardrails on runaway spend without sacrificing your business's agility. You started to strategize on your purchase options to get better discounts. And you started to be the person that got asked, well, what's the cloud spend going to be next for next month or next year? And you tried to forecast accordingly. And when you just get started, you might have won multiple hats and have done all of those cloud financial management tasks that Matt just mentioned. But later on, you will start to see the need to advocate for a dedicated headcount and eventually a cloud center of excellence team. 
So as you build that cloud financial management or FinOps practices in your organization, you start to realize that real-time and accurate cost reporting is so important because it enables your team to make better decisions and prioritize actions. And that improved cost visibility also helps encourage better consumer behaviors within your organization and better cost accountability eventually. So there's a high likelihood the better your cost reporting becomes, the more efficiently you'll be able to run your cloud operations. And as you get better at building and reporting, you may get to a more granular level, right? You might start to increase the dimensions of the data. You might have started analyzing your usage at monthly level and then daily level and then hourly level across different services and resources and time durations. And after you made purchase of such, such as savings plans and reserve instances, within your organization, you might have come up with decisions on how you want to allocate the benefits and discounts in your showback and chargeback model. And as your team is wanting to get a better understanding of their AWS costs, you created reporting at the application or the business unit level. Now, everyone here in the audience is at a different stage of their cloud financial management journey. Some of you could be way past what I'm describing here, or you could just be getting started either at the organization or at the individual level. So we wanted to take you back to the beginning of the cloud financial management journey and start where most of you start, which is the AWS console. So let's look at what's new there. And first, I want to just show what the AWS billing console looked like up until last week. You can see this AWS billing dashboard. And you can get here a couple different ways. You can search for the different AWS cost reporting or bill services. But I generally go in, I go to the top right, I click on my IM role or username, and I go to the billing dashboard. And it's here that you get a quick summary of your costs, as well as links that take you directly into the AWS bills page for more information. But then if you wanted to start to dig a bit deeper into your cost and usage, if you wanted to get things like right-sizing recommendations, you actually would get navigated to a whole different AWS cost management console. And it's within that console that you get another summary of your cost views, but this time you get the graph and you get the link that brings you directly into Cost Explorer. And you get a different sidebar here that talk, takes you through different services like AWS budgets, cost anomaly detection, right sizing recommendations. And then if you click into some of those, they actually take you back to the AWS billing console. Well, most of you have gotten used to this setup and have found information and tools you needed for your job but we wanted to improve this experience going forward. And that is why we're very, very excited to announce the new AWS Billing and Cost Management Console Home. This new unified console home presents you with lots of information that you can quickly gather information to help you make decisions or prioritize actions. And this new unified console also comes with a site navigation where we've previously consolidated and grouped of various billing and cost management services by use case, such as billing and payment and cost analysis, et cetera. And this navigation experience will be available throughout all of the billing and cost management console, so you can quickly transition from page to page and always transition from insights to implementation within minutes and have the deep links to the right job. So let's talk about like a real world example. Let's say at the end of the month, you wanted to get a, get a holistic view of your organization's cloud finances for a monthly AWS spend review. Now you can check that month over month trend in the cost summary widget and compare this with the spend growth that you had forecasted for. And if you see any major discrepancies, you can actually use the cost breakdown widget to zoom into the cost by different dimensions such as service or account or even cost categories, for example. You can identify any cost-related issues that require attention in a cost monitor widget. Um, for example, if there are any costs in the usage that have exceeded your predefined budget limit, or if there's any cost anomaly that got alerted to you. For those of you who always want to drive further cost savings, take a look at the savings opportunities widget. Maybe you are ready to improve the coverage rate or utilization rate for savings plans, or maybe there are suggestions for you to migrate to the latest generation of Graviton. For folks that are new to AWS billing and cost management, you can leverage a new experience organized by the specific outcomes or jobs to be done uh, that you want to achieve. There's uh, the savings and commitments, or there's budgeting and planning, 
And you can get to this new page by going in the sidebar. There's a new getting started link that brings you right here. And now, if you're an experienced CFM practitioner, you can still leverage this landing page to understand CFM best practices and how to improve your organization's cloud financial management maturity. Now, that's it for the unified console. But with this console home, you can now get your spend and usage data at a glance. And with that analysis that it provides at a high level, you're able to understand where you should focus on next. And you want to put together a cost analysis report for your stakeholders. But where do you start, Bowen? How can you begin to dive deeper into AWS costs and usage? Well, the answer most of you know is AWS Cost Explorer, right? With AWS Cost Explorer, you get that trillion 12-month view so you can understand the total cost. You can also zoom in to specific costs and usage with groupings and filtering options. And if you made, let's say, purchase for savings plans and reserve instances or spot instances, you can also take a look and display to see how your spend is covered by different purchase options. And if you want to dive deep into your specific AWS service usage, you can do that, as you're probably already familiar with. And I'll give a couple real-world examples to level set. You can have Amazon EC2. You can check out the cost by instance type. So you can understand the running hours of each individual instance type and group those costs together. So you can compare, let's say, the cost of running 1,000 R5 larges to the 24 R5, 24X larges that are running in your environment. You can see the cost difference between them. For other services, like S3, you can group by usage type to understand your costs in different S3 tiers, such as standard or infrequent access, and compare that to the gigabytes per month that you're storing there. And you can also take this comparison against your API costs in S3, like put or get. And as you start digging into this data, right, again, you start with the monthly data and then daily, and it enable the EC2 hourly granular data. So you understand how your typical business day looks like, the peak hour versus off-peak hours as you scale elastically, right? Um, and also you can download the report to understand the per instance cost to identify your top spenders. And once you're an expert at Cost Explorer, you might realize that there are some limitations, right? You want to do a year-over-year -year trend, but you can only go back to the last trailing 12, 13 months. You want to see resource-level data to identify what your top Lambda functions, what those costs are. But you can only do that for EC2. That is why we are very happy to announce AWS Cost Explorer has now extended its retention of historical data and improved the granularity of data available. So it, it increased the default retention to 14 months, so you can now conduct your year-over-year -year analysis. And you can also opt in to receive up to 38 months of data in Cost Explorer, so you can quickly to do your multi-year analysis. And for those of you who have dreamed about getting resource-level data just within Cost Explorer, your dream has come true. Now you can opt in to receive resource-level data for all AWS services, not just EC2, within Cost Explorer. On the Cost Explorer preference page, you have a drop-down menu. You can choose what particular service you want to receive the resource-level data for, and you can remove and add later on as needed. And both the 38 months of historical data and the resource-level granular data are offered for free. So now you can go into the Cost Management Preferences page and turn on this historical data, both for 38-month look back and for that daily resource-level granularity, again, for free. Now, you may be familiar with our feature that gives you that hourly granularity and the EC2 resource level granularity. That's been around for a while, but that's always been a paid feature. And some of you might have hesitated turning that on because you were unsure of what your usage would look like. Well, now with this new experience, we'll actually estimate what that usage will look like based on your prior last month's bill. So you can get a, a better sense of what those cost estimates could be by turning on that paid service. But again, the new historical and the daily uh, service level granularity for the last 14 days, those are both free, but you need to go back into the preferences and now activate them and turn them on. So now, let's go see these features in action. And on the left, you know, we're going to talk about what this looked like in Cost Explorer about a week ago. Right? This is the original look back view. And so you had this limited historical data retention, and it made it impossible for you to do a year-over-year -year analysis. So if you were to go into Cost Explorer a week ago, 
your last finalized bill would be October 2023. And if you wanted to go back to October 2022, well, you couldn't. The furthest you'd go back was November. And then, once your November bill, this bill, would finalize, you try to go back to compare that, and now there's only December available. So now, for free, you can go back to October 2022 to do your year-over-year -year analysis. And if you want, you can go back to October 2020. I know nobody really wants to go back to 2020, but the sense is now I can get that 38 month of historical data for you to see the month over month, quarter over quarter, and year over year analysis for up to three years. And you do not have to stay at the high level. You can zoom into a specific dimension to understand how cost and usage has evolved in the past three years within those scope. So as you turn this on, it's gonna take about 48 hours for it to backfill. And you might start to notice new trends that you hadn't seen before. And just a quick tip from the field, you might find that one month of the year is actually a bit lower than the rest. And for those of you that might have already experienced this problem, that month is gonna be February, right? Because you have less running hours in that month, less days. So don't be alarmed if you thought that you optimized costs in February and then they bounce back up in March. Now, as your usage in a particular service grows, you want to be able to dig deeper into those cost drivers. So adding that resource level data for the last 14 days and those and all the AWS services will allow you to understand what resources within those services are driving those costs. So we encourage you to enable it on any of the services that you're using. And in the cost management preferences, you can just you know, turn it on for all services if you'd like. Yeah, let's take a look at an example here. Right before this launch, you might have noticed a cost spike of a Lambda usage on October 6th, right? Um, other than the information of the total cost and maybe approximately 31.5 million seconds of usage, you don't really understand what has driven this cost spike. But now if you choose to receive Lambda function resource level details, you'll be able to just display and identify the top three Lambda functions that has caused a spike, it can also download the CSV file to analyze the per function daily cost in the past 14 days. So that's it for Cost Explorer. But as you've progressed in your cloud financial management knowledge, you wanted to go deeper and kind of get to the data set that powers Cost Explorer. And to do that, you've activated the AWS Cost and Usage Report, or CUR for short. You might be a FinOps guru or a data engineer, or could be both, right? You're ready to roll up your sleeves and analyze those data in detail. And we want to give you more options so we can extract more value to those data. And with the CUR, as it says on the slide, you get the most comprehensive set of AWS cost and usage data. And when you create that report, you can decide whether to aggregate your line items at a monthly, a daily, or an hourly granularity. And this sits saved into S3, so you can easily download your cur. You can then bring it into tools like Amazon Athena to run SQL queries against it. But uh, you can also visualize it using your own BI tools or Amazon QuickSight, or you can take this cur and ingest it into third-party tools that will do some of that heavy lifting of cost analysis and visualization for you. However, as our AWS products and services have grown, this report grew larger and more complex. And not just the breadth of all the services and SKUs that were provided, but literally the larger size of this file that you were getting delivered month over month. And any changes to the CUR, well, it could cause you to have to redo your data pipelines. And if you wanted to share your CUR for, let's say, a third-party analysis, well, you, want it, you might not be able to because of compliance reasons, right? Because you want to be able to provide it, but at the same time, you don't want to expose things like your organization's AWS account IDs or any visibility to discounts you might be potentially getting. But how do we solve all of those issues? A consistent data schema, a much reduced curve file size, and the ability for you to remove any sensitive information before you export? Well. To achieve all of the above, the answer is the new AWS Billing and Cost Management Data Exports. It enables you to create recurring exports with the most granular billing and cost management data in CSV and Parquet format. You can contain what data contained in your exports by using column selection and row filtering via a SQL interface. 
So this way you can control what information gets to be included in your data export and maintain a consistency for your data ingestion. So on this data exports page, you will see all the reports you just created um, and also the legacy curve table. You might have noticed another feature on this page, but we'll come back to that. So as mentioned earlier, you can control the data contained in each data export using column selection and row filtering via a SQL interface. You also have a column selection option in the console. So if you choose to use SQL query option, you will use the simple basic commands such as select from, where, and other SQL commands to generate and customize your data export from the cost and user report 2.0 table. And if writing SQL queries, if that's not your thing, and it's certainly not mine, you can actually go with the console option, and you'll select the data that you want to export and any table configurations with things like line item, time, granularity. And you will then use this column selector in the console to choose what columns you want, and then you can preview what that SQL query statement would actually look like. And you can enable your data exports in the management account, and that way you can have a data export for all of the linked accounts in your organization, or you can do this at the linked account level for just the cost and usage report for that account or any standalone accounts, just that one account you'll get the data for. Now, Bowen, before you mentioned a cost and usage report 2.0, what is a CUR 2.0? Well, we all know what's cost and a usage report, also known as CUR, now known as the legacy CUR. CUR 2.0 provides the same granular billing and cost management data to you, right? But it also brings many more benefits. To start with, the CUR 2.0 table has a fixed data schema. Unlike the Lexi CUR, it dynamically adds additional columns um, based on your actual usage in a given month, right? Um, but CUR 2.0 has a fixed data schema, so it helps facilitate data ingestion. Um, and also, CUR 2.0 table has improved and reduced data sparsity. So it collapses columns that are associated with things such as cost allocation tags, cost categories, and product and discount into a nested data structure, but still gave you an opportunity to write a query to extract those columns into individual columns in your actual data export. And what's more exciting, CUR 2.0 table now adds two additional columns. These are payer account username and usage account name. Um, but even with all those benefits, you can still leverage data exports feature to control what information, what columns, what role information you want to include in your data exports to be completely backward compatible with the data pipelines you have built when processing legacy cur. And while you can continue to use the legacy curves that you've already configured or create new legacy cur reports, we encourage you to get into the data exports and check it out for yourself. And this is because it has some of these new features that Bowen mentioned, especially things like usage account names. So you could finally see in that row what the account name, not just the ID. I know that's a feature that a lot of customers I've talked to have asked for. And for those of you that were eagle-eyed on that previous slide where we showed the new data exports page, uh, you might have seen something else that is possible now with data exports. So let's see what it is. You can now launch a cost and usage dashboard powered by Amazon QuickSight directly from the AWS Billing and Cost Management Console. And that's something that you've either deployed on your own, built on your own, or you've used pre-built solutions like the AWS Cloud Intelligence dashboards. Now, while this cost and usage dashboard powered by QuickSight doesn't replace those solutions, it makes it easier for those of you that don't want to manage a custom deployment that has other components like glue crawlers, like Athena views, and you just, or if you have limited QuickSight experience and you want this to just deploy it in one page. Yeah, think of this way. The cost and the usage dashboard powered by QuickSight that was just launched on Sunday is inspired by Kudos dashboard, which is one of the several cloud intelligence dashboards, right? So while it does not contain all the details and focuses by those cloud intelligence dashboards, um, it does give you an easy setup. So you can deploy a cost and a usage dashboard powered by QuickSight directly from the billing and cost management console without you creating a data flow or managing an online infrastructure. 
So it enables this interactive analysis where you're going to be able to securely share your cost insights with a broader stakeholder group that may not have traditionally had access to the AWS console or your management account. You can provide access to this data set on an as-needs basis as well, leveraging the row-level security found in Amazon QuickSight. So how do you launch it? Uh, we mentioned we have a unified billing cost management console, right? On that console page, you will find data analysis section and click on data export. Once you click on that, you will land onto a AWS data exports page. You have two options to launch this dashboard. Either you click on the green create button, or if you scroll down, there is a cost and usage dashboard powered by QuickSight window. If you click on that, you will be redirected to a home page where you will just provide a few key information. So first, you will name your dashboard, and then you will let them know what is your QuickSight username. If you do not remember that, there's a shortcut link. You just click on this, it will direct you to your QuickSight homepage, you will just copy paste your QuickSight username, and the next thing is storage options, right? You can either configure a brand new S3 bucket, making sure the name is globally unique, or you can select an existing S3 bucket if you already know the cost and usage data already previously stored there. The next thing you need to know, which is also the last thing, is the service role. Make sure you configure a service role so that your QuickSight can access the data from your Amazon S3 bucket. And that's it. So once available, you can deploy the cost and the usage dashboard from the data exports page. You can open the dashboard directly to the QuickSight environment. So once you get there, now you have this interactive cost and usage dashboard. There are multiple tabs. For those of you who want to get a high-level glance, you can click on the billing summary view. Um, it gives you the total savings and invoice spend, amortized spend of your organizations in one place. And you can move on to the month-over-month -month trend tab. So once you get there, you will see lots of graphs broken down by different dimensions, such as regions and product families and accounts. And the good things about the month-over-month -month trend tab is if you click on any items within one graph, let's say you click on Amazon Redshift in the product breakdown graph, all the rest of the graphs will be automatically servicing cost and usage data that is associated with Amazon Redshift. So you can focus on the analysis you want to make at that moment. That saves you a lot of time, right? But if you're interested in the specific product family cost and usage data, let's say compute storage database, data transfer and networking, there are specific product family tabs within this cost and usage dashboard as well. And with that additional flexibility that you get by using Amazon QuickSight, you can securely share access or, in, or even embed these dashboards without giving users the console access or giving them access to QuickSight itself. You can fine tune any part of these dashboards to suit your specific business case, and you can use this template as a starting place for further customization. And by saving this dashboard as an analysis within QuickSight, you can tweak the layout, you can tweak the visuals, you can add more filters, and you can even bring any of your own data or any third-party data that will help you cohesively evaluate how your cloud investment impacts your business transactions. And then when you're done creating this new analysis, tweaking the layout, tweaking the, the visuals, you can then republish this as a brand new custom dashboard for you and your teams to consume. Okay, let's take a breather for a second. This is a lot of launches in a short amount of time. We talked about the new unified console. We talked about the new historical data in Cost Explorer. We talked about the new data exports feature with the new Curve 2.0 table. And we talked about the cost and usage dashboard powered by QuickSight. So now we're gonna shift gears a little bit and actually talk about cost allocation because we talked a lot about ways to view your cost and usage data and what features you can use to get more granular insights. But the data is only as good as the metadata that you provide. Yes, 100%. The better you will be able to allocate your cost and usage data, the better you will be able to create that cost accountability with the business entities that are responsible for them, right? So according to this study by Hackett Group, Organizations who maintain high level of cost allocations and who've established and maintained a technology relationship with finance teams, they actually experience force multiplier effects 
improving cloud cost accuracy, SLA achievements, and overall cost savings. But Matt, can you talk about how can we allocate AWS costs and usage data? Yeah, sure, Bowen. So there's two main ways to allocate your AWS costs. And there's tag-based, using cost allocation tags. And then there's rule-based, using cost categories. Now, most of you here probably already have cost allocation tags configured. They're the same tags that you use for labeling your resources with environment, cost center, name. And you can then uh, take those cost those tags, and then activate them as a cost allocation tag within the AWS Billion Cost Management Console. And then once those tags are activated, you're going to be able to see the costs associated with those tagged resources within the cost reporting tools, such as Cost Explorer or the Cost and Usage Report. However, over time, it may be difficult to know when those cost allocation tags were activated or deactivated or if they're even still currently used. And that's why recently we introduced tag timelines. So you can now see next to each tag when it was last activated or deactivated, right? And if in that new column, if the last month, the last used month isn't the current month, then there's no resources that are currently using that cost allocation tag. So this is going to help you reduce your tag sprawl and it's going to allow you to perform hygiene on a regular recurring basis, let's say you know, quarterly or even yearly. So you mentioned there's another way, cost categories, right? So for cost categories, you can logically group your accounts and resources by using a multitude of different rules, such as service and regions and product and usage type or even charge type. So when you create your cost categories, that will become a filter in all of your cost management tools. So let's take a simple real world example. You can create a cost category that's specifically called environment, right? Because you have a, a pretty standard, maybe not all, but most of your AWS accounts, well, if they're production accounts, they start with prod. And if they're non-production accounts, they'll generally start with dev, test, and UAT. So you can build these rules to match against those account naming conventions so that anything that starts with prod, well, that gets labeled as production, Anything that starts with dev, test, UAT, that gets labeled as non-production. And then anything else that wasn't following your convention, well, that's set as an other cost. And now that cost category will flow through to all the AWS cost reporting tools. So now you can quickly see a grouping by environment, your prod and non-prod and other costs within things like AWS Cost Explorer and through analyzing your cost and usage report. Right. Um, split charge rule is another feature that is very important within cost category. So what it does is it allows you to define a source, which is the cost category value cost you want to split, and a variety of targets, which are the cost category values you want to split the cost across. Right. So for this example, we want to split the cost associated with the other environment to be in the way that 70% will be allocated to production and 30% to be non-production. And you might not know this, but cost category rules are retroactively applicable. That means if you create a cost category today, all the metadata can be retroactively applied to all the previous usage for up to 12 months. And so this is separate from the cost allocation tags, which only start flowing through when you activate them. So if you've never used cost categories before, or just getting started, you can retroactively backfill for the last 12 months and have it flowing through through all your AWS cost reporting. And if you're not sure how effective you currently are uh, on these allocation methods, you can actually check the cost allocation widget in the Billing and Cost Management Console home. Now, you may have noticed we haven't actually talked about cost by application yet. And that's why we're happy to announce a brand new feature, a brand new way to manage your application costs. You can now easily report the costs associated with any application that you have now defined in the service catalog app registry. So to enable this, you actually create a new application, you go into the wizard, and then you select all the different resources that are associated with that application. And once that's done, that's going to receive a unique AWS application cost allocation tab. So it's automatically going to enable it, and it's going to flow through, again, to the cost reporting tools like Cost Explorer, Cost and Usage Report, and you'll be able to see it there. So let's see 
For example, you've defined an application named My Awesome App in App Registry and have added the resource tags. So all the resources will be associated with this resource tag, and all of these resource tags will be automatically enabled as cost allocation tag in a format as AWS application colon My Awesome App. So you can use that filter in Cost Explorer and Cost Usage Report, or you can set up budget alerts or cost monitors using cost anomaly detection with that specific filter to detect if there are any unnecessary spend associated with your application. And finally, this year, we have also improved cost visibility into containerized applications. Um, it used to be difficult to understand how I can distribute EC2 instance cost amongst various containerized applications that are running on the same EC2 instance. AWS Split Cost Allocation Data, also known as SCAD, it scans across your consolidated building family looking for ECS resources and AWS batch jobs. It then ingests your EC2 CPU and memory metrics um, based on the reserved and actual utilization metrics into this SCAT tool. What SCAT does is it recomputes the ECS task level cost and usage data based on how the CPU and the memory resources are being consumed. So with access to this data, you can easily understand and optimize the costs of your containerized applications. And then you can allocate those application costs for those ECS tasks back to the individual business units. And any of those unused CPU cycles, well, they can potentially be just charged back to central IT. And you can opt into this feature from the billing and cost management preferences in the same place that you'd be enabling the historical features for Cost Explorer and the paid features for hourly and resource level granularity. So you can turn on there. That'll make it flow through the Cost Explorer. And then when you create a new legacy cur or new data exports cur 2.0 table, you can opt into this SCAD data to include the granular data set within. However, you might be asking, we've been talking a lot about allocation. Well, how can I actually integrate my existing chargeback and showback models within the AWS tools that we've been talking about all along? How do I ensure that the costs that, I'm, that are, are actually being accrued by these different end customers, business units, that those costs are what they see in Cost Explorer? irrespective of what my organization's discounts or credits or commitment discounts look like. How do I do that, Bowen? Well, the answer to that is AWS Billing Conductor. So with ABC, you will be able to group a set of accounts that share the same financial owner, right? It also allows you to configure the billing rates based on your chargeback logic. You can generate Performa billing views and Performa cost and usage reports that does not change the business relationship between you and AWS or your total invoice spend amount. It just gives you the ability to designate a primary account owner that can manage and generate those performance views for all the member accounts within each billing group and also allows you to have those usage amounts based on the billing rate you have negotiated with your end customers. So how do you get started? Well, first you need to identify the set of accounts that you want to pull into a billing group. And for the example we'll talk about, let's say it's a billing group that is a set of accounts for your HR system, right? So you create the billing group, you add those accounts in, and you designate one primary account to have that cross-account view that you traditionally would associate with your payer or management account. Now, if you just did that, if you just created the billing group, what you would get in Cost Explorer and the other tools is, this, is the view of your cost at public pricing. So then the next step would to be actually to create pricing rules, add those into a pricing plan, and then apply them to the billing group. And those pricing rules, they can be either discounts or markups at the global AWS service level or at the individual service level. So let's say you wanted to give HR 5% off their EC2 spend, but you could also mark them up for their S3 standard spend. Now, once you're done configuring your pricing rules, you can also add in these custom line items on a manual or monthly recurring basis. So for chargebacks, for things like your AWS support charges, you can charge HR just their portion of that support and inject it into their previous month's bill. 
If you wanted to create a manual recurring charge, let's say for a monthly AWS Marketplace subscription that HR uses a portion of, you can configure that as well in, your a in ABC. So once you configure the billing groups and the specific pricing plans with pricing rules you just mentioned, you'll be able to generate a Performa billing report and Performa cost and usage report, which many of you have let us know they're extremely helpful when you charge back, right? We've also recently made that Performa cost and usage view available in Cost Explorer. So this feature is important because you do not have to give out your payer account access, right? The primary account owner for each respective bidding group will be able to manage and oversee the cost and usage data for all their member accounts in each billing group. And the individual users within each billing group will be able to now finally visualize and optimize for the AWS spend without relying on you to generate those manual reports for them and disclosing this additional business information. And if you were curious about AWS Billing Conductor or ABC in the past, but you were waiting for things like this Cost Explorer integration, we encourage you to go ahead and start checking it out. We've also updated the pricing structure, where now it's a flat per account fee for enabling, so you can easily estimate what the cost would be for enabling the services on your individual AWS accounts. So now we're getting close to the end of our session, right? We walked you through how you can build and customize your cost report, how you can improve your cost allocations, and even charge back your AWS spend. Um, we also know that across AWS Cloud Financial Management Services, we have improved the visibility into your cost and usage data with many of the existing and new launched features. So how that increased visibility also can bring out the better consumer behaviors for organizations. And you can start to drive that new culture change where everyone feels empowered to manage their own cloud spend against their projected budget. And you may start to ask, well, how do we start to set goals against our cloud spend? Measuring, reporting, like we've talked about, it's great. But how do I actually tie this back to what my business cares about, which is outcomes? Well, this is where publishing KPIs come into play. So you might have already set up a few KPIs as you evaluate your success of cloud financial management practices, but our recommendation is make sure that you agree upon a set of KPIs that is measurable and can also be published in your cost dashboards, and making sure key stakeholders across organizations can access the dashboards whenever they want. And even better, if you can benchmark those KPIs and let teams compete against each other, the so-called gamifying CFM success will definitely change um, your internal behaviors and awareness. And maybe as you're developing these KPIs, this MVP is a manual process to gather all this data together. But as you regularly report to your leadership and your stakeholders on your progress, you work to get it in near real time, and you get feedback from your business in order to continue to fine tune. And that fine tuning really extends to the KPIs themselves, right? You want to start with these cost-based KPIs because they're easy to consume, they're easy to understand, especially when you're di you've been diving into this cost and usage data. But I'll give you like a quick example. Like let's say you're reviewing your year-over-year -year trends and you find that your AWS costs increased by 10% and you got asked by your leadership to explain why. So you dig into the, your KPIs, you dig into the trends and you find out that actually your usage of EC2, the running hours, increased by 40%, but your actual price per vCPU dropped because of the commitments that you've been making all along via things like savings plans and reserved instances. So you get into that, that meeting with your leadership, you explain all of that, and their eyes start to glaze over, right? So how do you improve this, Bowen? And that's why you need to correlate your AWS spend with your desired business outcome metrics, right? Let's say you do realize that your AWS spend grew by 10%, but in reality, your searches and reservations grow even much faster. Um, that's why the unit cost comes into play. When you put the AWS spend in context of business driver metrics, that's how you can truly evaluate the cost efficiencies. Um, and now you've been able to measure the cost efficiencies with your AWS spend instead of just comparing dollar and dollar and month over month. And let me have you click Bowen to show the, the rest of it. <laughs> so. Yeah. 
we understand that building these KPIs isn't easy, right? You start with these value drivers, and then you finally get to these value-based KPIs. And while we'd love to dig a bit more into KPIs, and we haven't even touched upon unit metrics, we probably would need a whole another session to cover it all, which is why we have some great sessions later this week that are gonna dive deeper into these topics, and we'll call those out at the end. But for now, we're gonna start to wrap things up with a summary of all the launches that we've talked about today. We first talked about our new unified AWS Billing and Cost Management Console, and it brings all of your cloud financial management services into one place and gives you a quick summary of your costs, alerts, and recommended actions. So you don't need to spend time trying to pull this data together. You don't have to balance between multiple consoles, download multiple CSVs. You can just take a look at the highlights and come up with a priority order for the actions that you want to take. Yeah, we talk about how Cloud Explorer has extended its retention of historical data. So now you have the option to receive up to 38 months of historical data that allows you to do multi-year analysis. And you can opt in to receive resource level data for all AWS resources, right? And all of this 38 months of historical data and granular resource level data are offered for free. We talked about creating the new data export experience where you create a CUR 2.0 table with a fixed schema to maintain the consistency of your data pipelines and the ability to select the columns that you want in the data set and being able to row filter using a SQL-like interface. So app registry resource tags are now integrated with cost management console. So all the app registry resource tags are now automatically enabled as cost allocation tags that allows you to visualize and manage your spend associated with applications. We talked about how the new data exports experience allowed you to create a new cost and usage dashboard powered by QuickSight that allows you to securely share with stakeholders and get quick, quick analysis that you can then customize into your own dashboards. And finally, we talked about the importance of cost allocation and how you can enable that cross-billing group, cross-account view for specific stakeholders with ABC or AWS Billing Conductor. So your chargeback process is more transparent, and when your end customers, users, business units, when they log into their accounts, they see only the charges that they are going to be charged back within your chargeback showback processes. So really hope all those new features and existing features combined together make a great leap forward for your cost reporting into cost and management data. We have all of our cloud financial management related sessions displayed on the screen right now, uh, but we can also highlight a few that's directly tied back to this talk, Matt. Yeah, so if you want to scan the QR code, that's gonna bring you to like a overview on our blog of all the sessions that are coming up this week. Um, but if you're interested in developing KPIs specifically, if that piqued your interest, please check out our Chalk Talk, COP206. Uh, if you are interested to dive deeper into visualizing um, cost and usage data, um, definitely check out our workshop, COP312. And if you wanna get hands-on and try AWS Billing Conductor for yourself, we highly recommend for you to check out our builder session, COP221. And with that, thank you everyone for joining us today. If you have any questions, Matt and I will stay here for a little bit, um, but we definitely want to invite you to also talk to our CFM booth.